In this video, the first in our series for macroeconomics, we are going to be exploring micro foundations. So to start off, what we're going to be looking at specifically in this first video on micro foundations is the basis of economics. And really, this is the basis of micro, but by far and large, macro is micro, just scaled up. So in that, we'll definitely be making that distinction between, hey, what is micro, what is macro, what is the difference in the two studies, and then build it up, get these micro foundations out of the way so that we can work towards building our macro models. So first of all, what's the difference between micro and macro? So let's take a look at that. So to start off, micro versus macro. Well, just in terms of the words in themselves, micro referring to small, macro referring to large. Outside of that, what exactly is going on? Well, in micro, what we are concerned about is we are concerned about individual agents, right? Economic agents, we would say those are consumers, producers, and we are interested in how they come together, how they make choices, and then ultimately the outcome for one good. Typically speaking, we are just focusing on one good, one service, and ultimately then the price or the quantity exchanged from that one good, that one service. So in this case here, often simplifi simplified, we can say that in microeconomics, we are focused on one market. That is, we might be interested in the market for used cars. We want to know, hey, what is that price of used cars? Is the market for used cars efficient? What is going on there? Are there changes happening? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. What is the value that society receives? What's the benefit society receives? All of these kind of questions would be very micro-related questions. We're taking a look at one market. Okay. So to jump on over then, macro, what's our distinction over here? Well, for macro, what we are looking at is all the markets, all the, I'll abbreviate that to markets, and we'll aggregate these, aggregated in a geographic area. Typically, that geographic area that we are referring to is a nation state. So, for example, we might be looking at the macroeconomic outcome here in Canada. Could be looking at the US, Europe, China, India, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Any nation state, even we could scale this down. We could take a look at it on the provincial or the state level. If we're looking at the United States, we can scale this down. But typically, what we're looking at with macroeconomics is this aggregation of markets, of output, of how much stuff we're able to produce, consume, etc., amongst a larger geographic area. So, hey, in micro, this might mean that we are just looking at the market for apples and trying to analyze just this market. In macro, that means that we are analyzing the market for apples and we want to aggregate the market for apples with our market for oranges. Now, we'll see in future videos that this here clearly has some problems with it. How do you aggregate apples and oranges together in order to find a common total, right? How do you add apples and oranges? So there's some issues with this and definitely things we will end up looking at as we progress through the course, of course. Okay. That being said, that is our foundation. That is our basis between the two fields of study, micro versus macro. We'll come back and we'll expand upon this more going forward. But let's carry on with our micro foundations and specifically with the basis of study. And this basis of study is the basis for micro, but of course carries forward to macro as well. And that is, is economics, and I'm not even going to say micro or macro. Economics is ultimately the study. Economics is the study of how we utilize scarce resources. So what does that mean? Scarce resources. Well, scarcity means limited. And so ultimately what we're interested in in economics is we start off with this assumption that we have scarce resources in the world around us. 
But you and I, all these individual economic agents, you, I, firms, producers, businesses, etc., all of us have near unlimited wants and desires. So only so many resources to utilize, only so much time, money, oil, etc., etc. But despite this limited resource, we have near unlimited wants. So, okay, that's the basis. Attached to this then, if we have scarce resources but unlimited wants, this then necessitates that we need to make choices. Right, and choices mean that, hey, I only have so much money, but there's a lot of stuff I want to do, a lot of stuff I want to spend that money on. I need to make choices as to what I'm going to do with that money. I only have so much time. Well, I have to choose what I'm going to devote that time to. And by making choices, by choosing one thing, that implicitly kind of saying we're giving up another thing. So choices then, choices incur opportunity costs. And opportunity costs are a big, a big cost of interest to us in economics. So opportunity costs is what we've given up in that next best alternative. So basis of our study here so far, we live in a world of scarcity. We have unlimited desires. So because of this scarcity, we're forced to make choices. These choices then force us to incur opportunity costs. So let's take an example. Let's take a look at an example of these opportunity costs. And let's suppose that you are, you have two invites. On the same day, let's say it's a beautiful sunny day and you have two invites to you, two different groups of friends. We'll say, there's the sun, nice hot day. And you have the choice to go with one group of friends to the movies, right? So into the movie theater, nice air-conditioned movie theater, get out of the hot sun for a while. Maybe it's a movie you really wanted to see. So that's your one choice that you could devote your time to. On the other hand, you have another group of friends that has rented a soccer field and they want you to come play soccer. Let's suppose that for each of these, you have to give up some amount of your time. And so let's presume that for the movies, this is giving up two hours of time. And for the soccer game, this is as well giving up two hours of your time. The problem is these are both scheduled at the exact same time between these two different friend groups. And you have to decide what to do. Right? You only have that one single two-hour block of time available to you. That's your scarce resource. You now have to make a choice. And if you choose one, well, your opportunity cost is that you've given up the other. So let's suppose, let's suppose that you have decided, you've decided to go to the movies. You've really wanted to see this movie. You thought it was going to be great. And so you go to the movies. You go and you spend your... $25 or whatever it works out to for your movie, your popcorn, etc. Okay, so you're here, you're at the movies, you've devoted your time now to this. Your opportunity cost then is that you have foregone soccer. So the opportunity cost of going to the movies is the lost chance of going to soccer. Okay, let's fast forward now. Fast forward. It is 30 minutes later, right? 30 minutes later, so you've already given up 30 minutes of this movie. You've already devoted that bit of time. That's gone, that's sunk, that's lost to you. You've already paid for your movie. That's gone, that's lost, that's sunk to you. Turns out this movie sucks, right? You're sitting there and you're just like, oh my goodness, why was I excited to go see this movie? This is terrible. How am I going to get through the next hour and a half? Question is, what do you do? Do you stay? Do you finish the movie? You're like, well, I've already put $25 towards this. I've already devoted 30 minutes of my time. Do you just, yeah, I've already paid the price. I'm just going to stay put and do this. Or do you walk out, you say, hey, you know what, that movie sucked. I put a lot of time, I put a lot of my resources into this movie already. That wasn't worth it. Oh, well, 
I'm going to jump ship and I'm going to go over and catch the last bit of this soccer game. Be able to play a bit of this still. What do you do? Do you stay or do you go? Well, what many people end up doing is many people end up staying. They end up staying through a terrible movie. And the reason why they end up say, staying is what we often refer to as a sunk cost fallacy, right? And in this case here, the reason you picked the movies over soccer was because you believed you were going to get slightly, right? At least the same, but slightly bet more benefit, net benefit from seeing the movies than playing soccer. I just thought maybe you get a little bit more enjoyment. That's why you chose this option. But you were wrong, right? You were wrong. So now, as you move forward through time, if you're focused on the fact that you've already spent 30 minutes, if you're focused on the fact that you've already devoted $25, well, you feel obligated to stay. But that's not actually how to optimally make decisions. The way to optimally make decisions is to make decisions in the margin. And what do we mean by making decisions in the margin? Well, making decisions in the margin means making the decisions at those incremental steps, right? That is, you're going for a walk. You're trying to get from point A to point B. At each step, you decide, should I go and take another step? It doesn't matter how many steps you've already taken. It's, is this next step, is the benefit from this next step worth the cost of taking this next step? That is, you ignore everything that's behind you, everything that's already happened, because that's sunk, that's lost, you cannot influence that any longer. So, okay, essentially what then happens is we fast forward, and we now have this new option before us. Still a nice sunny day. We have now the option to stay at the movies, which is boring. All right, this is a terrible movie. So stay at the movies, which is boring. Or on the alternative side, you could go play soccer. And as you are working through the rationale of this, this is, well, you could either spend another 1.5 hours, right? You've already given up 30 minutes. So you could spend another 1.5 hours at this boring movie, or you could spend 1.5 hours having fun playing soccer with this group of friends, right? In this case here, if we just cut this off, if we just phrased the question from this point here of, hey, what do you want to do? Do you want to go on a nice sunny day, sit inside and watch a boring movie that you're just going to sit there and dread every moment of for an hour and a half? Or do you want to go play soccer with a bunch of friends for an hour and a half? Well, now it seems like a little bit more clearer that, hey, the best choice for you is going to be to go play soccer. Boring movie, that uh, doesn't really seem worth it. What's changed, right? What's changed is the setup. Here, up above, we were stuck on this sunk cost. We were stuck on this fact that we had already devoted half an hour. We had already spent some of our money. We have a hard time letting go. We have a hard time admitting that we made a mistake, right? We have a hard time going, oops, that wasn't right. I messed up. I didn't pick the best choice. I should now just jump out and get what I can out of the other. Instead, what we often do is we fall into the sunk cost fallacy, which is we just stay put. But if we think about this as left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, just us walking along, oops, we put this foot in the wrong spot. Well, does that mean I should just keep turning left, right? Just keep going left, keep going left because, hey, I already made that, I already committed to it, let's just keep going. No, 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 no. We took that left turn, oops, we didn't like it, it was going in the wrong direction. Forget the sunk cost, forget what happened before. We now are at that next junction of our life and we just remake that decision based off of the marginal benefits, the marginal costs before us. In this case here, our marginal decision making is saying, hey, 
Soccer, all right, incremental step forward. Soccer looks like it's a much better payoff now than movies. So reevaluate, readjust, move forward. This sunk cost fallacy is a very hard one to get your head wrapped around. This is a really hard one to admit, and we see this all the time in the world around us. We see this with huge government or even private sector projects. We see government and private sector projects being done. We see them getting started. We see millions of dollars being thrown into building, let's say, some kind of factory here. And millions of dollars, millions of dollars are being thrown into this. But then in the process of building this new factory, this new hub, this new power plant, let's say, something's changed. Maybe something was wrong with the original budgeting process and we have massive cost overruns. Maybe something has changed in the regulatory framework. Maybe the price of electricity has changed such that this new power plant's no longer worthwhile. Well, what do you do? You've already committed millions of dollars to this project. Do you keep throwing money into this project to see it through to completion? Or do you recognize your sunk cost and you take a step forward and put the remaining scarce resource, that remaining money, towards the other projects that were also vying for that money, right? Keep in mind, even with government, even with private sector, same concepts apply. Scarcity, there's only so much money. So they make choices. Do we put this money towards a power plant or towards healthcare, towards education? Okay. Once you make that choice, if we chose to put it towards this dam, that means we're not putting it towards education. Oops, we made a mistake. The power plant is not what we thought. This is not working out like we thought. We have massive cost overruns. This project is not actually worthwhile. Do we continue? Do we throw millions, maybe billions of dollars more into it? Or do we recognize our mistake, recognize the problem, and move our resources into that next best alternative. This is again just our movie theater and soccer analogy, right? In this case here, these projects that we've already sunk millions, sometimes billions of dollars into, well, that's our, that's our movie. We thought it was a good idea. Everything at the time was pointing that this was the best use of our scarce resource. We make mistakes. It was wrong. What we need to do is we now need to make our decisions in the margin. We take that next step forward as that next foot falls. We take a look and we go, okay, should we keep going to the left? Should we keep putting more money into this project? Or are there other projects out there also vying for this money that actually gives us more benefit on whole? Marginally making that decision based off of what is before us, forgetting, ignoring the sunk costs, those non-recoverable costs from behind us. That's one of the big things with these sunk costs. They're gone, they're not recoverable, so they just need to be forgotten. As we move forward, it's just, hey, what future costs do we yet have versus what future benefits are yet to be had? Okay, so that's our basis of economics. We have scarcity, choices, opportunity costs, we have that economic agents, they make their decisions in the margin, that is with those incremental steps. Every step, is it worth continuing going this direction still, or should I change directions? In the margin, those incremental changes. Finally, what we touched on was this whole idea of a sunk cost fallacy. The idea that, hey, forget your sunk costs. It's very common that we get stuck up on these sunk costs and we stay in that despite the problems with it. But no, 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 hopefully we've seen that the best case, the best way forward is to forget about your sunk costs and just look at, hey, what are my benefits going forward versus what are my costs going forward, not what have I already sunk. That's the big part there. Okay, let's take this, let's bring this forward and let's take a look at a model. And our first model that we're gonna be taking a look at is known as our production. Possibilities 
frontier. Production possibilities frontier or PPF. So what our PPF, what our production possibility frontier is, is just simply taking a look at this relationship, this trade-off, our choices between two different goods that we have the option to produce. And we need to say, okay, are we going to produce good A or are we going to produce good B? We only have so much time, so much resources, so much oil, so much money, et cetera, et cetera, to devote. So what are we going to devote those resources to? In this case here, let's suppose we are looking at just a car producer, a vehicle manufacturer. So a vehicle firm, maybe this is Ford, Honda, something like that, right? Some company that's making vehicles. And very simply, they have the option to either make cars or to make trucks. They only have so many workers, so much capital, that is equipment, machinery. These are our inputs to our production process. There's only so much of that. They only have so much money for raw materials, electricity, energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What do they devote to which one? Well, this production possibilities frontier is getting at the highest level number of cars, highest level amount of trucks, that this firm could produce if they devoted all of their resources. And what we presume is that this looks something like this. Bit of a concave curve as we go through. And that is we could in one extreme put all of our resources to producing cars. We could in the other extreme put all of our resources towards producing trucks. But what we witness is that as we change, as we move through, as we decide to produce, let's say we decide to go plus one truck, right? Let's say that's plus one truck. We witness our opportunity cost in how many cars we've had to give up. And we see in this case here that plus one trucks has resulted in a small loss in car production, right? Very, very tiny in relation to how much truck production has increased. We can witness this continuing. We can say over here, let's say we're now at this point. If we go again, plus one. Well, we witness that as we produce more and more trucks, our opportunity cost, that is the number of cars given up, right? Number of cars given up, number of cars given up. Our opportunity cost begins to get larger, right? Maybe that's a little bit hard to see. I'm trying to write larger there. That is, we have larger and larger opportunity costs the more and more we devote ourselves to one good or one service one thing that we are doing what we can witness is that this is especially true once we get to the extremes here let's say that as we go oh let's use the right tool for that make a straight line let's say that this here is from doing this point to plus one being all trucks so being eh, all but one truck to all truck production. What we witness in this case here for our opportunity cost is a huge opportunity cost. That is in this case here, we have this massive loss in cars for that last truck produced. So what we have in this case here is we have changing opportunity costs. The more we push ourselves into producing one good, one service, the more we're utilizing all of our time, money, resources, labor, capital into producing trucks, the larger and larger and larger of an opportunity cost we face in terms of how many cars we've had to give up. So in this case here, the opportunity cost of a truck is how many cars we gave up to produce another truck. Okay, we could work this out just strictly. Hey, I did plus one truck. How many cars did I lose? And we could get cars per truck as our opportunity cost of a truck. 
In this case here though, we have a curve, not as easy to find, hey, what our trading or what the rate is of trade-off, unless I specifically gave you these numbers along the way. But what we could do is we could make a simplifying assumption for our production possibilities frontier. And this is a simplifying assumption. This is an abstraction from reality. And what we could presume is that we could presume that cars and trucks have a linear relationship between each other. That is, it's just, hey, this is how much cars I could produce if everything went to cars. And it is just a trade-off that is constant all the way through. That is, I don't have an increasing opportunity cost in this case. In this case here, with this straight line, I would have a constant opportunity cost. And let's see what that works out to be. Let's say that I could produce 50 cars if I put all of my resources into car production. Or I could produce 25 trucks if I similarly put all of my resources into truck production. Well, what we could do then in this case is we can take a look at the line here and we can work out the slope, the rate of trade-off. And keep in mind that the slope of the line is just our rise over our run. That is rise over run in terms of our units. That is the number of cars over our number of trucks. Hey, what did we say on this previous one? We said that the opportunity cost of an additional truck was how many cars I gave up, cars per truck. So same idea going on here. If I find out the slope of this line in terms of cars per truck, I will get the opportunity cost of plus one truck. That is how many cars I would give up to produce an additional truck. So how do I figure this out? Rise over run. Well, I actually have everything that I need already. I know my rise. I know that I have a rise of 50. And I know that this is over a run of 25. Let's keep in mind, though, what is happening as I am falling, I am running, right? So technically, this would be negative 50 and plus 25 or vice versa positive 50, negative 25. Either way, working that out, I get negative 50 all over 25, yielding for me negative two cars per truck. That is yielding for me my opportunity cost of truck production, being that in this scenario, every time I want to build an additional truck, I would have to give up two cars. Okay, but what if I wanted it the other way? What if I wanted to know what my opportunity cost was of producing a car? That is, hey, this is my opportunity cost of producing a truck. What is my opportunity cost of producing a car? Well, if I want to know what my opportunity cost of producing a car is, I want to know what is my truck per car. How many trucks do I give up to produce a car? Trucks per car. Okay, well in this case here we do the exact same thing but reverse. Instead of rise over run, cars per truck, we would do run over rise, truck per car. So in this case here, what does that yield for us? That yields 25 over negative 50. 25 all over negative 50. That's going to be negative one half trucks per car. So that is, in this case here, 0 0.5 truck per car. Every time I produce an additional car, I give up half of a truck. Right? And you're like, well, maybe that doesn't make sense. Maybe we couldn't just actually only produce half a truck. So essentially, every time I produce two cars, I lose one truck. That's the trade-off there. So again, what you might be able to realize in this is that our opportunity cost for cars is just strictly the inverse of our opportunity cost for trucks. And that's exactly the scenario that we would have in this case here with a too good production possibility frontier. What we could do, going back here, we could very similarly do the exact same thing, get our corresponding 
opportunity costs from the slope of this curve. We don't need any calculus to go and differentiate to derive the area underneath or to derive the slope from this. All we need to do in this case here is we will just create rays that connect our points of interest. So in this case here, maybe let's make those a bit bigger so we can see them a bit better. We would create a ray between our points of interest and this ray, this straight line between the two. Well, if we had our points of interest, we could work out cars per truck and we could work out the opportunity cost along this stretch. What you would have to keep in mind, however, is that in this case, every ray would have a different slope, such that as we increased our truck production, the opportunity cost for trucks would increase. Very similarly, if we were to increase our car production, well then the opportunity cost for cars would similarly increase. Because right, in that case there, opportunity cost for a car, again the ray, but if we wanted the opportunity cost of a car, we would do the truck per car to get our opportunity cost for a car. Okay, so basic model, basic way that we can take a look at this trade-off that, hey, we live in a world of scarcity, we have to make our choices between our two different things that we can produce. We can very similarly look at this from, instead of a firm producing stuff, we can look at this from, say, your and my perspective. And in this case here, typically what we would refer to this as is instead of a budget or instead of a production possibility frontier, we would refer to it as a budget line. And in this case, let's suppose that you have a fixed amount of money and you are choosing going out for dinner and you are trying to figure out how much burgers versus how many beers you're going to have. And in this case here, our budget line, this $20 is such that Every point along this budget line is the full exhaustion of this $20. All of our money is utilized. Nothing is left on the table. We've spent it all, all of our possible consumption bundles as we move along this line. Very similar to what we had before with our product, with our producer, Ford saying producing cars versus trucks. In this case here, it's you with your scarce resource being money saying, okay, how many burgers can I buy? How many beers can I buy? And what possible combinations are available to me? Same kind of idea. We can work out the opportunity cost. Hence our slope. Rise over run. So that is, in this case here, burgers over beer. Burgers over beer. Burger per beer gives me the opportunity cost of plus one beer. That is, for every additional beer that I end up consuming, I'm giving up X burgers. So just like we worked it through in this scenario here, you look, they look very, very similar in this scenario. Difference is, one side we're talking about production, the other side we're talking about consumption. But the basic idea between them is the same. Okay. One last final concept to get through in this video. We're almost through it. Last one to talk about is this concept of efficiency. And in efficiency, that is a terrible written, that looks like chicken scratch. Maybe let's try that again. Let's take a look at this concept known as efficiency. That's a little bit better. Okay, so with efficiency, we have two types of efficiency to look at, to evaluate. These two types are allocative and productive. So let's start off with productive efficiency because we already have our base model here to take a look at that. And our base model being this 
production possibilities frontier with our trade-off between cars and trucks. Okay. So, for a good, for our production rather, to be productively efficient, it needs to fall along the frontier. That is, all of our resources need to be fully utilized, the frontier of our production, any of these points, A, B, or C, any of these points would be productively efficient. If we had another point, let's say a point out here, point D, well, this point D, we would say that this point here is unobtainable. It is beyond our frontier, it is to the right of our frontier, we do not have enough resources or we don't know how to efficiently use our resources to get there. That is, we don't have adequate technology to utilize our resources to get to D. So either not enough resources or not the right technology to be able to produce at D. Thus, D would be unobtainable to us. We could also have another point. We could call this point E. And point E would be productively inefficient. At this point here, well, we would not be fully utilizing all of our resources. In fact, we could, uh, let's make that actually a straight line. There we go. We could go all the way out to anywhere along this line here. And just by allocating our resources better, by saying pushing our labor, by using all of our materials, not letting as much go to waste, we could obtain a productively efficient scenario at either B or C. That is, E is productively inefficient. It is overruled by B and C. They are both able to produce more given our resources. So E would be productively inefficient. Okay, what about allocative efficiency? What allocative efficiency is referring to is how do we allocate our resources? That is, how many cars do we produce? How many trucks do we produce? And this is where our marginal decision-making comes into play. Allocative efficiency occurs when our marginal benefit equals our marginal cost. And okay, what do we mean by this? What do we mean MB? Let's write that down. That is marginal benefit equals our marginal cost. Okay, what's being made meant by this? Well, marginal benefit is the extra benefit I receive from consuming an extra unit. Marginal cost, well, marginal cost, this is the extra cost I face for producing an extra unit. Allocative efficiency is going to occur when my extra benefit is one and the same as the extra cost. In this case here, if we're talking about car versus truck production, you can, all right, if we take a look at this, we already took a look at it. As we ramped up our production of trucks, our opportunity cost of trucks began to increase. That is to produce plus one truck, I was having larger and larger extra cost, right? Incremental change, marginal is an incremental change. So, hey, my marginal cost of increasing trucks increased, got bigger and bigger and bigger, the more and more and more trucks I ended up producing. That being said, what's happening to my marginal benefit from buying trucks? Well, imagine society with zero trucks. That first truck produced, that's gonna have massive benefit to society, right? We're, we're like, wow, this is amazing. We can move stuff so much easier. But as we produce more and more and more and more trucks, well, that extra benefit we get from the extra truck becomes less and less and less. At some point, when every vehicle on the road is a truck, well, we're not really getting any extra benefit out of having one more truck on the road, right? So in this case here, while our marginal cost is growing as we produce more trucks, the marginal benefit is shrinking as we produce more trucks. 
when these two are one and the same to each other, right? One's growing, one's shrinking. There's going to be a point where they cross. That point where they cross is the level of truck production that is allocatively efficient, such that we are allocating our resources in the most efficient way. We are allocating the right amount of scarce resource into truck production. Okay, an allocatively efficient point must also be productively efficient. That is, there must be some allocatively efficient production of trucks that would similarly fall onto this PPF. Let's suppose it's point B here, and this is the good part. If point B is an allocatively efficient production of trucks, that is, we can say that the marginal benefit of trucks equals the marginal cost of trucks, well then, at B, we have some level of car production. It must also then be that the marginal benefit from our cars equals the marginal cost of our cars. And again, we would have allocative efficiency occurring jointly, both in our cars and our trucks, as well as productive efficiency occurring by being on our PPF. So final point there, that wraps us up for our first video. Big ideas, we live in a world of scarcity. Scarcity necessitates choice, choice necessitates opportunity cost. Typically speaking, the more and more we do of one thing, the larger and larger the opportunity cost becomes of continuing in that one thing. That is, the more trucks we produce, the higher the opportunity cost of trucks becomes. We showed all this using our production possibility frontier, using our budget constraint, and we wrapped up by taking a look at this allocative versus this productive efficiency. In the next video, we're going to be taking a look at supply at demand, and we'll wrap up this idea that we looked at here into the next one in order to build our supply and our demand modeling process. If you have any questions about efficiency, scarcity, choices, or opportunity costs, sunk costs, any of that, please feel free to reach out to me through email or by a post to the D2L discussion board. Thanks. Until next time.